And folks, it's my pleasure to turn it over now. Please give a warm welcome to John S. Hall. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, it's good to be here. So, it occurred to me yesterday to tell this untrue story about the first anti-folk festival I did. Um, some of you people may be familiar with an individual named Latch. So, so, um, so I met Latch at, at ABC No Rio, and he saw me perform, and he said, you know, I want you to come and play at this festival. And I was like, okay. Um, and see, this is weird. I didn't know him or anything, and I thought he said, anti-fuck festival, right? <laughs> so, so like, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do, so like, I decided to write this thing to read at the, at the anti-fuck festival, and then when I got there, I, oh, it was anti-folk, so I couldn't, I felt like, well, this is, I'm not gonna read it now, but then I thought it would be fun to read it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Having been asked to perform at this anti-fuck festival, I have to confess that for the most part, I'm not against fucking, although there are some circumstances in which, in fact, I am anti-fucking. For example, I'm against rape, including statutory rape. I'm also against humans fucking non-human animals. And I suppose there are also certain settings where I would adopt an anti-fuck stance. For example, at the symphony, people should not be fucking during orchestra recitals. Or for that matter, chamber music. In fact, even more so for chamber music than orchestras. An orchestra could maybe drown that shit out, but a string quartet performance would be absolutely ruined if people were fucking during it. <laughs> and of course, I'd be against people fucking here at the anti-fuck fest, but I would think that would be obvious. I don't know, though. I don't think I can think of all that many instances where I would be anti-fucking. So while I am glad to have been asked to perform at this anti-fuck fest, I can't help but wonder whether I really belong here. So I actually wrote that yesterday. But thank you. I would like to ask um, uh, Debbie, is she still here? She left. She oh, she is, okay. So Debbie Dalton uh, graciously um, consented uh, to accompany me on this next uh, work. Isn't it, like, I think, oh, by the way, I think that's your drink still there from, yeah, so it's conveniently still here. Um, <laughs> You like you 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 need to tune, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know what? I think I'll just start, and then like, you know, once you're in tune, you can just join in. Okay. All right. This is called uh, it's called Pants, and I wrote this on New Year's Day on my way to perform at the St. Mark's New Year's Day Marathon. So there's some references to that, just so that you know you're situated temporally. Um, that's what was going on when I wrote this. God help me, I love that man's pants. They were a dark and stately gray with an understated green plaid pattern, barely distinguishable in a brief glance, which is all I dared to take. I didn't want to stare, but by God, they were fantastic pants cut in a traditional but by no means stuffy or conservative style, not the least bit trendy or hipsterish hipsterish but timeless and tasteful and true they were true fans and god help me i wanted them i am not normally prone to jealousy or covetousness to each their own i say although i would favor a mass redistribution of wealth from those who have far more than me to those who have far less but in that moment when i saw those pants i also favored a redistribution of those pants from the man who was wearing them to me. The man who was wearing the pants seemed perfectly amiable, and had I had his self-confidence and success, I might have been able to ask where he got the pants. Perhaps I would have learned that I could buy a pair myself around the block for $40, or perhaps I would have learned that they were purchased in Europe for, 40, for, for 400 euros. But I learned nothing of the pants, so I will never know. I will never have such pants. In the moment, I could not ask, so consumed I was by envy. All I could think of was how I wanted the pants, those very pants. Not my own pair, but that pair. 
Not later, but now. I want them now, I thought. I wanted to hold a knife to the man's throat and say, your life means nothing to me, pig, but if it means anything to you, you will give me those pants immediately. Because I wanted those pants so much. Oh, those pants so much better than mine that made me feel suddenly ashamed as if I was wearing pajamas. I was wearing my yoga pants that day. I don't actually do yoga, but I found these yoga pants that were really comfortable. Perhaps the man wearing those pants wears pants like the ones I have on for pajamas. I have very occasionally worn these pants that I have on for pajamas, not these, the yoga pants. But here I am on the first day of the year wearing these pants instead of those wonderful glorious pants. Pants of transcendent splendor and beauty. Fuck me, I wanted those pants so badly I could taste it like ashes in my mouth. I wanted to tear the pants off them and put them right there, put them on right there and then and head off in style to St. Mark's Church to the Poetry Marathon. Instead, I walked right past him, did not smile, did not acknowledge him or his pants, but he has ruined my day perhaps my year, perhaps the rest of my life, that man and his beautiful fucking pants. Thanks, Jeff. Well, Debbie never actually finished tuning, so, but it was, it would have been good. Maybe we'll try it again next time. Start tuning now, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie. Oh, good. She, you got it. Hey, Thanks, Debbie. Debbie Dalton. That was from an original. I, that was from an original idea by Ray Brown. <laughs> this next one. Uh, uh, so those two were never before performed. This has been performed before. I don't know if I performed it here. John Berger might know. Did I ever do this one called Tits? Did I ever do it here? No. Okay. He would Sir. know. It's called Tits. <laughs> um, tits. Uh, oh, so I was on the subway. And I didn't have much time. I had like two stops to go, or maybe three stops to go, and I noticed this ad for breast augmentation surgery. <laughs> and I quickly wrote this. I kind of think it might be nice to have tits. Like, so then, if I'm in bed with a woman, we could suck each other's tits. That sounds kind of nice. I think that would be hot. But it's a slippery slope, I would think. Next, I'd probably want long hair and makeup, and then I'd probably want most of my body hair removed, and then before you know it, I'd want a vagina, and I assume that would mean I wouldn't have a cock anymore, and that would mean that instead of fucking women in the vagina with my cock, I'd be getting fucked in my vagina with a strap on, because I like women, and even if I had a vagina, I would still want to be fucked by women, not men, which maybe is close-minded of me, but there it is. So I probably shouldn't get tits. So probably I should stop eating so fucking much, else I'm going to get tits. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Ray Brown. The piano is already in tune, fortunately, so, uh, so we'll be right ready to go. Uh, here's this next one again. Never before performed. It's been a prolific, unlike Debbie, I've had a good prolific year. Yeah! Screw you, Debbie! <laughs> That's not what I meant. Uh, if I could, if I could... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I wanted to say there. It's called, um, uh, this one, you know what, I'm not even going to say the title. I'll just say it's in seven parts, you know. So then the, it begins with part one, and then the second part follows and just goes to part seven. <laughs> I've invented a new diet. I guess the thing about Ray Brown is he likes me to always start. You can always, you could also start. <laughs> I've invented a new diet. Whenever you are hungry, instead of going into the kitchen and eating, go into the bedroom and fuck or masturbate. Water and clear broths are also permitted. This diet won't work all that well if you have a job, unless you have either a lot of self-discipline or an extremely permissive employer. However, I have a week off work, so I am testing this diet out right now. I will let you know how it goes. Two, I'm on day two of the fuck or masturbate diet. I have checked the scale twice today and I haven't lost any weight, but I am not discouraged. My theory is that I've replaced some of my weight with water weight. I've been drinking an awful lot of water. I've had 11 orgasms. Three, I'm on, I'm on day three. 
of my diet and I've already run out of the clear broth and it was tricky making more because I felt that I ought to jerk off while I was making it. So it was like making the broth with my right hand tied behind my back. <laughs> then after making the broth for balance, I jerked off with my left hand tied behind my back. My conclusion is that before beginning the fuck or masturbate diet, clear broths should be prepared in advance. Four, day four. For several hours today, I was so weak with hunger, I couldn't have made it to the kitchen even if I had wanted to. I did make it to the bathroom. I've decided it is probably not a good idea to leave the apartment, because if I were to bump into a friend, and that friend happened to be eating a pretzel or a knish, I would grab it out of his or her hand and devour it right in front of him. This diet is important to me, but it is not worth losing friends over. Part five. It is day five of the Fucker Mastery Diet, and if you're just joining me, the idea is that it's... <laughs> so stupid. I am so stupid. <laughs> If you're just joining me, the idea is that instead of eating, you fuck or masturbate. Technically, I suppose it should be called the fuck or masturbate fast, as the word diet implies some kind of eating is involved. When I first conceived of this project, I thought I would probably be unable to resist eating, and I didn't want to feel like a failure, but here I am on day five. I haven't eaten a thing, and I've lost six pounds and had 38 orgasms. I'd say so far, it's been a success. Six. I'm on day six. I've begun to hallucinate every time I orgasm. <laughs> the, Hindu, the Hindu goddess Lakshmi appeared to me several times today and promised me wealth, fortune, and prosperity, both material and spiritual. Then her husband Vishnu appeared and asked me if I was fucking his wife, and I said, no, I swear, not even a hand job. No, Lakshmi has four arms, and each one has a, has a hand. <laughs> <laughs> that is in really bad taste. <laughs> Vishnu appeared to believe me and then disappeared. I haven't seen Lakshmi since, and it's probably just as well as I am so hungry at this point I might have tried something with her. Seven. More No, yeah, seven. Oh, it's in eight parts, sorry. Eight parts. <laughs> More hallucinations. I saw Kali, goddess of change, pres pres preservation, and destruction. Parvati, goddess of love, fertility, and devotion. Radha, the life energy of Krishna. And for some reason, Daenerys Targaryen, the unburnt <laughs> queen of the Andals, the Roy and of the first men, queen of marine, Khaleesi of the great grass sea, breaker of chains, and mother of dragons. And she was, in fact, in this vision, riding a dragon. But, and this is interesting, it wasn't Drogon. It was Viserion. This made absolutely no sense to me, and I'm starting to become concerned for my mental well-being. I am glad to be returning to work tomorrow. Eight. This morning I returned to work, but before I did, I ate three bowls of cereal. I forgot about that. Three bowls of cereal, two vegan sausages, a fruit salad, and toast. Then a bowl of chili, some tortilla chips, and peasant bread. I drank a quart of orange juice and then had some sorbet. I've gained back three of the 11 pounds I've lost, but I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I had 53 orgasms, and a few of them were mind-altering and enlightening, and all of them were entertaining. All in all, I am pleased with the results of this diet, and I expect I will try it again the next time I have time off work. That's by far the longest piece of the evening. The rest of yeah. not think it's a good idea to save the longest piece for last. I think you're asking for trouble there. But, so so now now I feel like I can like coast the rest of the way. This is I think the shortest piece of the evening. <coughs> I wrote it in that chair I think, if that chair was there on Monday. I, I wrote it in the chair that was right around there on Monday. It's called the centaur. It's very experimental. I don't I don't really know what I think about it. No, wait, just chord, just like jerk. Yeah. Do you know Glenn Bronca? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. The centaur was carrying a box. Don't ask me how. A box full of testicles. Don't ask me why. Testicles collected on the battlefield, don't ask about the war. The battlefield full of fallen shoulders, soldiers, don't ask who died. 
soldiers of fortune, soldiers of mercy. Don't ask how their testicles ended up in the box or why when the box is dropped they bounce like ping pong balls and scatter themselves across the rainy city sidewalk. The testicles in the box of the centaur. The centaur. who was on stage when I wrote that, but like, Julie it was Julie Lamondola, was it? <laughs> well, I could not explain how on earth she would have inspired that. <laughs> but that's the weird thing about inspiration. Like when I wrote the anti-fuck thing last night, I was watching like this crazy brass band at the Blue Note. Have you ever been to the Blue Note? It's like crazy. Don't, I mean, like, why would you? But, like, this great brass band was playing, so I went. It's like a total tourist trap, but... Okay. This has been performed many times before. John is probably sick of it. Sorry. But that's what you get if you come every time I'm here. Uh, it's called The Chosen. There is almost nothing worse in the world than to have a brief glimpse of clarity, of the absolute, of all and everything, and to realize that that is as close as you will ever get because you have not been chosen. It is even worse to realize that you were chosen and that you failed to meet the challenge, to realize only too late that you had a chance to truly make a difference in this world and you rejected the offer either out of fear or disinterest or a lack of belief in your destiny. You could have been a savior, a messiah even, and in this age, that would have meant magazine covers, television appearances, movie deals, book deals, women, men, dolphins, whatever you like, and that reminds me of something I've been thinking about. You know how they have bestiality? You know, I just realized, like, this piece actually involves, like, humans and non-human animals having sex. I know, right? Like, I'm a total hypocrite. Yeah, you should be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> they have bestiality. Is that like a fetish for like fucking seafood? Like trying to see how many octopus legs you could take up your ass at one time? Or electric eels? Or like fucking a whale in the blowhole? Or like trying to get a dolphin to blow you? Dolphins are very smart. They can learn how to get blowjobs. You could get a blowjob or at least a flipper job from, well, maybe not you, but maybe like you gotta figure someone out there somewhere has gotten a blowjob from a dolphin. Like a Dr. Doolittle type who could talk to the animals, learn their languages. Remember the musical? Maybe take it, uh, anyway, and, and teach the dolphins how to please him, or her, I don't know, and I figure those s and folks are really missing out if they never used lobsters for nipple clamps. There's all this possibility out there, and it's going to make you wonder, what's wrong with you? That time that God spoke to you and showed you the way clear as day, you were like, no, no way, too much work, I'm busy, I'm too tired, I don't even believe in you anyway, what's in it for me? Well, you fucked up, didn't you? You sell your soul to the devil, you get like four dollars. But if you had come when God called, you would have gotten whatever you want, a nose job, 50 inch TV set, a waterbed filled with Callista Flockhart's urine. That's how old this piece is, and I've never updated it, because who can beat Callista Flockhart, right? I mean, nobody, like, that's the reference, it just, it just needs to stay. All right, that, you know what? That's enough. <laughs> it really just goes on for another three sentences, but that's a good place to stop. You know, after Callista Flockhart, I was like totally out of steam. It's called, this one's called Everlasting. Me and Ray have done it once before, right? But not here. It wasn't here. Where was it? The church. Oh yeah, we did this at St. Mark's instead of pants. Remember pants? The guy with the pants? I wrote that. I was like, no, you know, we'll just stick with this one. And I'm glad we did. It's called Everlasting. We're getting, we're getting there. I'm going to do three more. This one and then two more. Okay? Okay. It's called Everlasting. Everything swells up, all pink and beautiful, like flowers in a meadow. There is beautiful music. There is magic in the air. There is sunshine in the hearts of all the living, breathing beings. It is beautiful. The weather is beautiful. The day is beautiful. Everybody smiles and laughs and forgets their sadness and troubles for a while. It is very, very nice. Nothing bad happens for a much longer period of time than the normal amount of time it usually takes before something bad happens. 
The period of nothing bad happening lasts an unusually long time. And everyone sits with it and enjoys it and breathes it in and breathes it out and it lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. And then, at last, at long last, when it seems as if it can't possibly last any longer, it lasts even longer. It goes on and on. It continues to last and last. On and on it goes. Lasting and lasting and lasting until it seems as if it may be everlasting. It seems as if it may last forever. The possibility that this state of seemingly eternal bliss might actually be eternal fills everyone so full of optimism and hope that the happiness that they had been feeling actually increases so that everyone feels even more happy and even more hopeful. And still, the feeling lasts and the situation lasts. The fact that everyone knew that it would not in fact last forever in no way mitigated the unprecedented feeling of joy that they all felt. They all felt joy. They all felt love. They all felt hope for as long as it lasted. And it lasted a long, long time. Yeah. Hey folks, you're listening to John S. Hall, and he's not done, he's got two more for you. I'm coming out the tip jar for John. The so next one is my most vulgar one, I think, and then it'll be followed by the loudest one. <laughs> Suggested donation is five bucks at the Sidewalk Cafe. Get your bucks together and put your hands together for John S. Hall. Thank you. Do you have a concept for this? Because sure. like I didn't give you any instruction, any any idea. I don't know. Well, we'll see how it goes. They music. So I've done this here before, but never with piano. So so Ray Brown. I want to thank Ray Brown again for humoring me. It's called the miracle of childbirth. <laughs> Some people are excited to hear the miracle of Jover. Thank you. Your father fucked your mother. At least once your father and your mother were in bed and your father got a heart on and he stuck it inside your mother and they fucked. Sometimes maybe your father fucked your mother in the ass and, on, and maybe on the night that you were conceived, maybe they did that before or after, or maybe they didn't. Maybe your father never fucked your mother's ass, but on the night that you were conceived, one thing is certain. Your father fucked your mother in her cunt. Now, now I like that line because of the I'm pentameter. I don't usually use the word cunt, but like gives the. You know, maybe your mother sucked your father's dick first, and maybe your father ate your mother's pussy. Maybe your father sucked your mother's clit while sticking a finger to a, your mother's slit until she got really wet. Maybe he got his whole hand up there. If you have older brothers or sisters, then your father probably could have gotten his whole hand up there. If not, then maybe not. But at some point, your mother was wet and loose enough to accommodate your father and they fucked. Maybe they did it doggy style. Maybe your mother got on top of your father. Maybe your parents liked to talk dirty to each other when they were fucking. Maybe your mother screamed, oh daddy, oh daddy, fuck me daddy, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. And then maybe your daddy shouted, here it comes, here it comes, get ready bitch, here I come. And then maybe your mother said, come at me, come at me, oh yeah baby, fuck your mommy. Fuck your mama, sweet pussy. Oh yeah, daddy. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Or maybe they were very quiet. But at any rate, eventually your father came and his sperm shot out of his dick and it went up your mother's and it fertilized her egg. And that was you. That was you in your mother's womb, growing like a virus for nine months, making your mother fatter and fatter, making her sick, making her bum, making her hate your father for doing this to her, making her hate you, this thing inside of her like a virus, growing and sucking like a leech attached her, sucking her blood, drinking her like a vampire fish, growing and sucking, sucking and growing until one day you want out and you burst through the snotty membrane and you pop out of your mother's cunt all covered with blood and a bloody umbilical cord still attaches you to the inside of your mother somewhere till someone snips it off and you are severed. You are a separate being. This is the miracle of childbirth. To some it is proof that there is a God. 
Now, after you were born, maybe you sucked your mother's suck out of your mother's stick. Maybe your father wiped the shit off your shitty ass. I don't know. You'll have to ask them. But that is basically the way people are born. In a nutshell, that is it. Unless you were a test tube baby, which you weren't. So just face it. <laughs> your father fucked your mother. The next time you're fucking somebody, just try to keep that in mind. Thanks. And I got one more. Short, short one. Thank you. Thank you again. I had fun. I hope you did too. And yeah. oh. Oh, and fuck me, who's next, okay? Gold is up next. That's going to be fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy to have performed after Debbie and before Gold. It's like, yeah, awesome. So, thanks. It's called Socks. Look at all my socks! Oh, so many, many socks! I can't even believe it! Can you imagine having so many socks? I can't even begin to count them all, let alone even think about wearing them. So many socks. How did I get so many? Where did they come from? Hey! Why do I have so many socks? I'm inundated. I can't. No, I'm sorry. This won't do. I cannot have this. This is too many. I cannot have this many socks. This will not do. Please take some of these socks immediately away at once. Ah, yes. That is much better. Thank you. This is much more manageable. This is quite good. This is quite precisely the quintessentially right number. I am extremely pleased. Thank you. And, th and thanks to Ray Brown. And thank you. John S. Hall, ladies and gentlemen.